I'm delighted uh, on behalf of the Berlin School to welcome all of you and especially to, uh, to welcome our, our, our guest tonight, Alexa Clay. Um, Alexa is, um, is a leading expert on subcultures, on innovation of, of all sorts. She's an innovation strategist, but particularly innovation from what she refers to as unlikely places. And uh, we're going to have a chance this evening to, uh, to speak to her about those and to talk a bit about what's presented in, uh, in her new book. And um, I am holding it up in hopes that you have a chance to read it. This is a hacked version that we made uh, that street artists in New York made. So there's an alternative to that cover as well. <laughs> we'll be auctioning that off later. <laughs> uh, but uh, after our discussion, and uh, after a, a chance for all of you to ask Alexis some questions as well, uh, we, have, uh, we have books available for sale and we'll have uh, Alexis sign them if, if, if you wish as well. Um, Alexa, you have, um, you have many, many pursuits related to um, uh, innovation, to um, uh, different economies. We're going to touch on those, but I want to, uh, to start by asking you about misfits and about the entrepreneurial economy that you see them driving. Yeah, sure. So maybe to start, I think um, I like this phrase that he used before, rogue species. And so maybe we can use that as a little bit of a thread as well. Um, but my first exposure to these rogue species, I think, came you know, really in my youth and being um, you know, the daughter of two anthropologists who were very much misfits or outsiders in their own right. So my mother researched alien abduction for a time period and traveled the world speaking to people who felt they were abducted by aliens. And my dad um, grew up on a small farm and then you know, got a scholarship to Harvard. And so always had this kind of poverty mindset within very privileged types of traditional institutions. And you know, both lived this, this sort of misfit path in a way. And you know, growing up, my heroes were people like Joan of Arc or um, you know, uh, Henry Thoreau, who you know, lived on Walden and experimented with his own hermit time. And, and so I think that really provided the foundation for really valuing people who, have, who maybe make us uncomfortable or who have very different experiences of consciousness than we might have. And, and people that are not you know, valued by the mainstream, people that um, in many ways are disenfranchised by, by the mainstream economy. And so the first exploration was, was almost really as an empathy exercise of saying, how do we recast the net of entrepreneurship and look at uh, fringe cultures, look at pirates, look at hackers, look at gangsters, look at individuals within black market economies and understand how they're innovating. Someone who runs a traditional drug business, for example, is an entrepreneur. You know, they're building out a product, they're managing customer customers, they're developing a brand, and often they have amazing leadership skills. They're often very charismatic leaders. And so how do we really bridge these worlds of traditional entrepreneurship and more informal types of entrepreneurship? Get outside the narrative of the sort of uh, Zuckerberg hoodie wearing privileged entrepreneur and look at people that are really innovating uh, from the fringes. So that's how the project really initiated was how do we extend some of that empathy and look at the bulk of, you know, in, in some places, 70% of a country's economy is in the informal economy. So how do we look at that or aggregated over $10 trillion in the world as part of um, these markets? So how do we look at really the mainstream economy in a lot of ways? I'm wondering if you could uh, just say a bit more about what you see as the, the DNA of, of those misfits. At one point in the book, you talk about um, Steve Jobs and Richard Branson as having mm -hmm. hybrid DNA. Yeah. And it's one of, the, one of the many moments which I think are, are particularly helpful in the book where you're differentiating uh, in a way the formal or uh, conventional entrepreneur from the, the, the informal or misfit entrepreneur. Could you say a bit more? Yeah, about yeah, definitely. Um, with the caveat that death, like Steve Jobs and his, you know, the halo around Steve Jobs is something that I think everyone is really exhausted by. Um, but 
at the same time, I think you know misfits can certainly be entrepreneurs, but not, not all misfits are entrepreneurs. Some of the people that we profile in the book are deeply uncomfortable by by capitalism, and they'll you know they'll even use that word. Others you know in who are running drug businesses are very interested in you know free market economics, and so I think we really look at a range of ideologies of people who have various degrees of comfort with the current economic system. Um, but then I think both Branson and Jobs, you know, are interesting misfits. Branson himself, um, you know, credits his dyslexia and attention deficit disorder with a lot of his success um, as an entrepreneur. And I think, you know, Jobs is someone, uh, for better or worse, who lives, you know, a very different type of life. And he used to interview people for Jobs and ask if they'd ever done LSD as part of the hiring criteria. To, and, you know, if they hadn't, he didn't feel like they could truly understand you know, what Apple was meant to be about. Uh, so I think, yeah, I think both, both of those protagonists definitely have a bit of misfit DNA that are wrapped up in the personality of an entrepreneur. But even more interesting are, you know, people, people that are part of hacker collectives that aren't necessarily transacting in the mainstream economy or, you know, don't believe in the command and control sort of traditional bureaucracies. And what can we learn from those models and those structures? You work uh, in the book around a number of different boundaries. You talk about uh, certainly the mainstream, the formal versus the informal. You talk about systems that people are on the fringes of or try to disrupt. Um, how important is that to the, not just perhaps our definition of misfits, but the self-definition of misfits? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, um, so I studied economic history and one thing I became really interested in was this moment when basically liberal economy got invented, so to speak. And so around that time, you had all these conduct manuals that were being distributed en masse that were really teaching people how to participate in this new economy, providing a, a crystallization of an ethos of what it meant to you know, go and work in the factory or to be a good entrepreneur, to demonstrate certain virtues of this market economy and and I think similarly the the misfit um, ethos is really to debunk a lot of that you know what would be in our conduct manual which is what they were called at the time um, well we're emerging out of the history of the industrial economy we're we're getting we're very much in a traditional uh, a transitional economy the birth of the freelance economy the growth of the sharing economy movement in many ways and so I think the principles that we talk about that would be you know in our sort of manifesto or conduct manual are more around informality and more around self-governance uh, we talk about hustling the power of hustling and just the that sort of dogged determination uh, the, the necessity of copycat practices, of not putting a premium on R&D or originality of intention, but of shared knowledge, of pooled knowledge. It was interesting for me to learn that um, there was this great uh, sort of movement around IP pirates who came to the US, who stole uh, patents from Western European countries and commercialized those, and that was key to the US Industrial Revolution in many ways. And so, yeah, we're, we're really combating, I would say, the sort of dominant discourse and actually looking at more subversive skills, whether you're you know, an entrepreneur or, or that tempered radical within an institution or someone operating more on the fringes or on emerging types of economies. Or even someone in an advertising agency. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, maybe. You've just mentioned in... <laughs> I mean, it's a, in, yeah, I think... I think you know advertising has to change dramatically. Um, I'm a big fan of Adam Curtis and you know the century of the self, and I think there's a lot of damage definitely that advertising has done to sort of link us to this growth built model. And so, how can we actually use advertising to get people excited about emergent types of futures? I think advertising has a great uh, plethora of you know skills and tactics that we could actually employ to creating very different models of, of economy and reality that we live in now. You mentioned hustle and you mentioned copy. These are two of the five ways that you talk about at the heart of the book um, uh, that individuals can use to unleash their inner misfit. So yet another reason why I would urge you to, to read the book is that each of us, it seems, can in fact uh, become a, a successful misfit. Uh, 
Alex, I'm wondering if you can, um, in fact, go through those five or uh, you know, talk a bit more hustle copy and then the other three. Yeah, so hustle really started as a bridging principle between the world of black market innovators and traditional entrepreneurs. And it was a word that was being used on the streets by people running drug businesses, but it was also a word that you know friends of mine who were in tech or entrepreneurs were getting little tattoos that said, you know, hustle. And so it provided an interesting people really to look, look at the work. And I think the first conversation that really solidified it for me was in speaking to a woman who um, had dropped out of the world of venture capital and private equity and started doing work in prisons. And she found that the, ex, that the people that were in prisons who later you know, became ex-cons were amazing entrepreneurs who just needed uh, training in more traditional forms of entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship. So she ran business model uh, competitions with them, and then she created an incubator called Defy Ventures. And their whole premise is on this idea of transforming the hustle, of getting these guys who maybe don't have CVs that are readily accessible to employers, and re-narrating their skills around what they have done in the past. So even if they've managed these illegal enterprises, what are some of the assets that they can pull from that to put on their CVs? And so that, that program is incredible. We met a ton of amazing hustlers through it. And then a subsequent conversation was with someone called King Tone, uh, the former leader of the Latin Kings. And what he was working to do was to re-engineer, basically introduce the change management program of this gang and say, well, how do we transform gang culture in the US? To, how do we allow gangs to become much more like social movements? And I learned definitely a lot from him about leadership, um, but also about identity transformation. I think one of the other principles that we talk a bit in the book is uh, pivoting, and not pivoting in the sense of lean startups and pivoting enterprising, um, but pivoting in our personal and professional lives. How do we take these enormous, courageous leaps? And he's someone who went from being literally the king of this underground organization to being in prison and then getting out of prison and cleaning toilets. And now he lives in a gated community in Arlington, Virginia, which is where I grew up, uh, which is very strange for, for him. And uh, everyone really that we interviewed had this experience of going down these these crazy rabbit holes in life and not really knowing necessarily where those would lead and be, the the ability to tolerate ambiguity and take risk was something that I just thought was done so courageously by a lot of the people that that we spoke to. Uh, I mentioned copying before. I think increasingly this is something that like traditional incumbent companies can learn a lot from, particularly around you know R and D. I think that there's a lot of interesting experiments being posed now by companies to do pre-competitive pre types of, of R&D. You know, R&D didn't used to exist. Uh, you know, companies during the Industrial Revolution pooled a lot of this knowledge, and it was, it was more uh, accessible to the sector rather than becoming proprietary, and now it's become really proprietary. And so we've really looked at ways in which companies within pharmaceutical uh, industry, for example, can actually go in on drug development together and share some of that knowledge, which is, you know, in an industry that's meant to be targeting the public good and really delivering essential medicines, that's, that's necessary to weed out the redundancy of those types of efforts. Uh, I like very much when you're talking about uh, pivoting in the book that, as you say, it involves not only organizational change, but, but personal change. And there are various techniques for this. One of them, uh, talking about decelerators, yeah. where, in yeah. fact, in trying to remake or reassess your own core values, that becomes a really central way in which to, to affect change. Um, it leads back, for me, to the question of, of how an individual, particularly in an organization, as an entrepreneur, is is able to affect change beyond himself or herself. In other words, one, one conducts a personal pivot, one re-examines um, you know, individual values, but can, can that also just lead to frustration because of uh, you know, what's going on organizationally or environmentally? Can the cultures that you're in tolerate your authenticity? 
particularly for entrepreneurs. And I've worked with a lot of entrepreneurs um, and set up something called the League of Entrepreneurs, which was really focused on almost creating peer-to-peer -peer therapy systems for these, for these people because they're trying to create huge transformation or bring in social or environmental types of business models into these companies that really care more about the bottom line. And so they're these bridging species between sort of emergent new forms of economy, and yet they're trapped in these old institutions and, and many people that think with these old paradigms. And so, you know, how, how do those people kind of unlock the change they're trying to create in companies? You have to find a culture that, that's open to that. And many of, many of the people I've been working with, you know, have since left. Someone who is doing incredible microfinance uh, types of ventures at Morgan Stanley didn't feel like at the end of the day the company really could absorb his vision for what the future of banking looked like. And that was hard. He invested seven years in trying to do this. Someone else who was at Ford Motor Company was trying to get the company to think about mega city mobility. So looking beyond just everyone going out and purchasing their own car, but at urban transport options. And he had you know, a lot of success, but also a lot of pushback. But he came from a long line of of misfits or entrepreneurs. His grandfather had been beaten by Ford's henchmen you know, back in the day when they were unionizing. And so he almost had this masochistic relationship with the company between um, having an extreme loyalty and was really protective over it while at the same time wanting it to transform. And I think even amongst the informal or black market innovators that, that we spoke to, they're also not just born into the, these cultures. You know, we tried to choose examples like King Tone of people that weren't just experiencing this fallenness into the criminal econ economy, but were actively trying to transform those cultures. And I do think it's about finding the right match. Um, and not everyone will be able to sort of uh, you know, be their fully authentic self within an Exxon or within a Mexican drug cartel, for example. Either. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Thoreau, you just mentioned Ford, henchmen, uh, but many of the other uh, examples in your book and um, uh, the points you've made so far tonight have to do with the extraordinary transitions and transformations taking place today uh, in terms of IT, in terms of you know, changes in ways of work, uh, in, in, in terms of, of, of industries and, and economies. How much would you say that the, the, the misfit economy that you described is very much tied to the early 21st century? From a technological standpoint? Yeah, I think it really depends. Um, I think there, I think you see, so some of the people that we profiled were in prison for 10, 15, 20 years. So when they get out, they have no knowledge of Facebook, Twitter. Um, they are create, they're not, you know, they're not suited to becoming entrepreneurs in the tech industry. And so I think partially that, that became really frustrating. We just did this bus tour across the US going to um, cities in America that were poised for reinvention, New Orleans and Detroit and Pittsburgh. And um, it was really striking to see on the one side of town all these amazingly sort of uh, rich tech incubators and co-working spaces. And on the other side, just these deeply impoverished communities that had amazing entrepreneurs but weren't necessarily part of that uh, Silicon Valley wave. And so how do you bring some of those communities uh, closer together, but even um, it's funny because even amongst the the on the tech question, the Luddite communities that we spoke to. So I have a great um, appreciation, I would say, for Amish communities, and have spent some time there. And uh, they this is an Amish newspaper that I was reading in Indiana that someone gave to me. But they have advertisements for technology as well. So they have simple, plain phones that they sell with no apps and no text messaging, and all you can do is uh, call people with credit. And the merit of the phone is its simplicity. And then you also have sort of fax machines that are being advertised and sort of farm machinery that's from the 50s. And so even within these communities, there's more of this slow adoption of tech, which I think 
in many ways is part of a message that we need to infiltrate within you know tech incubators today is you know how are these technologies these digital technologies impacting people's subjectivities in their lives and their emotions and what is ultimately you know going to be the legacy there um, and so Kevin Kelly has written a lot too about Amish communities and how they have this network of beta testers who will first use a gadget to see what its impact is before democratizing it to the community and it's really the opposite of more of this American type of impulse towards novelty and anything that is new must be instantly absorbed. Um, so yeah, I think I think I think there's a certain technological shyness in the book that uh, I, I definitely yeah. support. For those of you who are just getting to know um, Alexa, she's you, obviously you are the chief misfit. Yeah, I uh, saw that. Um, yeah. Also, founder of um, or co-founder of the League of Entrepreneurs, uh, as mentioned. Also, founder of Wisdom Hackers, which we can talk about. Um, but lastly, um, at least for for tonight, uh, a further alter ego of uh, of Alexa's is that she's known online as the Amish futurist. So, uh, uh, in terms of technology. Uh, and in terms of uh, this, this I think profound um, uh, willingness to to engage with with different kinds of of economic and and, and social systems, you spend part of your year mm -hmm. uh, in Amish country, yes? Well, I did some research in Amish country to create this character. Okay. Um, and for anyone who's thinking about creating an alter ego, I would highly recommend it. Uh, it's, it goes along with a lot of the principles in the book, in fact. It's, it's really about pivoting or hacking your sense of self and identity. And so for me, the, the calling to live this more sort of Luddite lifestyle was partially motivated by humor. Um, I've been going to all these conferences where there are all these futurists who pretend they know what's going to happen in 10 years or in 20 years or in 50 years, and it's really irritating. Um, and it reminds me of people that used to have these like prophecies in the 17th century about the future and would like, um, you know, provide these sort of they were you know these false these false prophets essentially. And so it became funny to think about well, what if we had you know a bunch of Amish people show up at these conferences who really uh, didn't have this sort of techno-optimist view and really didn't have that kind of exposure to the future and get them thinking about what, what the future was and how the future could actually be based on, on certain humanistic principles of the past. Um, and so that's how the character evolved and I basically started dressing up as an Amish woman, sort of in a similar dress to this, and wearing a bonnet and um, going to tech conferences and going to startup conferences and calling myself Rebecca and just talking to people uh, and asking really Socratic questions, asking really existential questions of like, well, why are you creating that app and, you know, what is that doing and, you know, um, and I think people really enjoyed it, and it was it was performance, but it also allowed them to sort of deprogram and get out of their sort of techno optimist uh, attitude as well, and think more critically about what they were developing. Is there an upcoming tech conference that we'll be able to see you? <laughs> well, I launched Rebecca? I launched Rebecca at a Toa, which was actually just this past week, but I did it three I think three years ago now, which was. Uh, yeah, really, really good fun. Berlin lent, lent itself well to the development of an alter ego. <laughs> yes. You're not the first, I think. <laughs> yeah, Bowie, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, being here, uh, Schultz and Friends, but especially the Berlin School of Creative Leadership, I wanted to ask you about leadership. Uh, misfits would seem uh, uh, to be the, um, the consummate individuals uh, who are difficult to lead. Um, and I'm wondering both in terms of, of um, that side of the leadership equation, but also about misfits being leaders themselves. Can you say a bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the misfits that we really profile embrace more decentralized models of leadership. So, for example, Anonymous or some of the hacker collectives that we spoke to 
really, you know, they don't have traditional hierarchies. Um, even looking at some of the pirate cultures, they invented very egalitarian models of, you know, constitutions they created before constitutions existed in Western European democracies. And so I think, you know, as more people learn how to be misfits or entrepreneurs within traditional organizations and institutions, you have to change your models of governance and how do you allow for more self-governing behavior at the workplace. I think that's a huge question that we explore in the book. Um, one of the statistics that really got me going when I started researching this was looking at the number of saboteurs that are within companies. And something like 33% of employees within companies are actively sabotaging their employer, which doesn't mean just like passively not doing anything or like reading books during work, but like actively doing things that hurt the company in some way. And I, um, I also just uncovered recently uh, a live action role playing community around like the office that was really, really funny and just plays on some of the banality of office life. But I think so many people do find these traditional work environments um, you know, not, not very motivating. And so that's been massive, is how do you think about um, creating conditions where people aren't just following someone's orders, but are actually allowed to bring their own entrepreneurial initiatives into the workplace. Uh, when I worked at Ashoka, which is a leading nonprofit focused on social entrepreneurs, we had a whole model of entrepreneurship at Ashoka where each person didn't have a tight job description but really had to develop an entrepreneurial venture. And in that way, the organization was much more of an incubator than a traditional nonprofit. And I think many companies are experimenting with that as well. I'm wondering, uh, I, I guess, returning to what we had said uh, about pivoting, this, this uh, linkage this ongoing relationship between the personal and the organizational, the, the individual and, and the system. Uh, I'm wondering if you could say more about um, how empathy fits into that. Empathy so important to, to leadership, so important to, I think, the kinds of, of engagement and openness and informality that you that really r run through the, the book. Um, yeah, I Come mean, back to where you, you started in terms of, uh, of, of speaking about the importance of empathy there. Yeah, I think um, empathy is definitely you know, one of the things that people are trying to re-engineer you know, education around. You know, how do we develop these, these types of soft skills? And empathy being one of the most important elements for you know, economic coordination amongst other things. But one of the guys we profile was who, who had interesting things to say about leadership but also empathy was building, um, was an artist who built starships. So he built these huge spaceships and then he had people live in them for periods of time. So maybe it was a little bit like a LARP or a sort of immersive research project. And aboard these starships, they would figure out what future culture, future space colony cultures could look like. And so one of his insights was really seeing how when he was the commander of the starship, he was really turning that starship culture into an environment that suited his leadership strengths. And I think a lot of leaders do this. You design uh, work cultures or the institutions that you're a part of to your own strengths rather than necessarily to environments that are best for the team. So what they did, ended up doing in this one starship is really rotating the leader every week so they could have a different experience and also create greater empathy of you know what motivated people and what people needed in those situations. Um, and even for entrepreneurs, you know, so much of getting your new idea embedded within a corporate culture is about empathy and also a certain stealthiness in being able to game a system, in navigating corporate politics. Uh, one person I interviewed early on had said, you know, admitted they spent over 70% of their time strategizing ar around other people and thinking about, you know, in very Game of Thrones style, like how, how can I get this person aligned with, you know, this, this particular venture? How do I pitch this person? What are their core values? What do I need to appeal to? Uh, which, you know, a lot of master manipulators know, you know, also have good empathy as well. <laughs> and, and in this case, they're using it for good. That's great. Uh, you mentioned um, hacker collectives. Uh, you spend a good deal of time in the book talking about uh, historical pirate organizations, which uh, uh, I think is a wonderful part of the, the read. Um, 
I'm wondering, having um, bashed, uh, I, I think reasonably, a lot of big bureaucratic corporations, are there more positive examples of, of corporations or maybe more uh, traditional organizations that have transformed themselves or because of the efforts of entrepreneurs you can identify as, as kind of happy case examples of success? Yeah, definitely. I mean, with the first report that um, I authored was called A Field Guide for Social Entrepreneurs and was all about, you know, 20 happy case studies of entrepreneurs that had found relative success in building and scaling initiatives within the corporate context. Uh, Vodafone's and Pesa gets talked about a lot. And um, I think that's interesting because the company, you know, initially the entrepreneurs who were behind that venture couldn't get support for their company. So they had to get external financing from a development agency. And, and so I think it's, you know, I, I never have, would have like a blanket thing to say about an institution. I think, mm -hmm. you know, there are different, even subcultures within pockets of organizations that have slightly different operating principles. But there are a lot of companies that are becoming more invested in this question of how do we design our cultures for entrepreneurs. Um, you know, Google's 20% is very notorious in this camp. Um, you know, Valve is a gaming company that's explored more democratic principles, though uh, I, I think it was reported in Wired that it's, they, have, they abolished hierarchy, basically, and um, as a result, the workplace became like a middle school petri dish where there were just all these little power uh, games and cliques, essentially, in lieu of traditional hierarchy. So I think we're, you know, it's, it's right for organizations to be skeptical of some of these more alternative types of principles um, because they are new and they haven't been tested, but they do need to be experimented in. Yeah, I think as, as a footnote, um, part of Valve's experimentation grew out of consulting work that Giannis Varoufakis did oh, cool. in terms of pushing, yeah. pushing yeah. for what he saw <laughs> as an, uh, an internal open market mm -hmm. where people competed for positions of authority. Yeah. Uh, but that's another discussion. <laughs> um, I want to, uh, to ask one more question and then, um, and then open things up and I hope that, uh, that others here have questions as well and keep, continue the, the discussion with, um, uh, with Alexa. The question I would have um, is um, maybe a bit close to home, but um, it has to do with learning and education uh, where the, there's so much now in the more traditional management or business discourse about um, the, the need to, to learn in order to transform. Some talk about you know, um, uh, you know, learning from failure, failing quickly, failing wisely. Um, how does that approach to education either fit with wisdom hackers or with the, the, the general approach uh, that misfits take to uh, the, 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 the economy? Yeah, I mean, I think Wisdom Hackers is interesting as a phenomenon, um, not to say it's particularly successful, but the aim with Wisdom Hackers was to create a peer-to-peer -peer community where people could explore deep questions, you know, questions that they held that we don't really often get to ask in everyday life because maybe we don't give ourselves permission to ask or we don't have the accountability mechanisms with other people to ask those questions. And it was interesting because it was it's it sort of it emerged at a time when most people you know have are have lost a sense of religious affiliation where maybe that would be another forum for answering those questions, um, and also at a time where maybe the internet is transforming you know our spirituality in some ways. I think if you look at how spirituality has evolved over the centuries, it often tends to mimic the dominant economic paradigm that we're in. And so it's interesting to think about what um, you know, information technology and digital culture is doing to spirituality. Um, it's funny because Michael's here and we're actually working on this interesting uh, next project related to an incubator for the next Messiah, which is um, a satirical take at like, what if you built an incubator using sort of startup principles for the next uh, world guru, basically, or the world's next Messiah. Um, and how would we, you know, how would we find them, and how would we uh, skill them in some of the philosophies that would be ripe for this era? But I think you're seeing, you know, regardless, this huge uh, dominance of more informal learning cultures that are forming. Uh, our traditional educational models were built very much on, you know, a sort of assembly line capitalism that is no longer needed, and so. 
Um, I think there have been experiments, really, that some which you know really haven't worked, frankly. But I've been a product of a lot of alternative schools. Um, you know, growing up from Quaker school to, you know, a, a self-governing hippie school that I went to high school at, um, which have been, yeah, enormously valuable in my life. And I think it's, you know, even with what you guys are building with these immersive modules around creativity, you know, it's, it's fantastic because this stuff is evolving so rapidly and change is happening so quickly. And so that means that our educational formats have to be much more temporal. Okay, would you like to announce tonight that the Messiah is coming at a specific <laughs> time? Or if you, yeah, well, if you're an aspiring Messiah or find this idea remotely engaging, um, come talk to me or talk to Michael and uh, share your ideas. Because there's actually a huge advertising component of it, of how we, how we launch this in a very guerrilla way and um, what, what some of those sort of philosophies that we should be using or mashing up. Yeah? Most of my friends in the startup world Feel, and including myself, the whole IP world is broken. Um, it's too expensive, um, it's too slow, um, and it hinders innovation, and yet uh, um, VCs really push for, for IPs. How do you see this being fixed? How, how do you feel this can be fixed? I think it's explosive and I would definitely share sympathy with your point. And so I think part of what we've tried to do in the copycat chapter of the book is spell out ways in which, you know, the current IP system is broken and bring attention to entrepreneurs who have said that, as well as some of the historic debates around IP, because I think this has always been a question where um, particularly, you know, startup entrepreneurs feel really threatened and hurt by how the IP systems really are rewarding more Goliath types of companies. Um, I think particularly in cases where IP is around a product that is an essential good, so when you're talking about energy or health and people have patents around that, I think that's morally dubious. And so some countries like Brazil or in India have um, you know, made IP around some of these products illegal because it does touch on that public good debate. I think you're also seeing people within hacker communities, and um, the Pirate Party is sort of a joke, but it was the first way in which uh, people became politicized around the question of IP. So I think that's continuing, and I think it's definitely a fight. And I think uh, corporations, for example, that were really stung by IP copycats are now realizing that, like, Putting people through expensive lawsuits, or is you know, is not particularly efficient and wastes tons of money. So how you know, I was approached by someone at Syngenta the other day who wanted to think about how they can design more flexible um, IP around some of what they're doing and even experiment with open IP. So I think it's a, a conversation that's certainly evolving, um, and it's happening in many different pockets or worlds. Thanks for your talk. Just a quick question, so as you looked at some of these basically economies, did you notice anything really interesting about kind of new forms of currency that evolved in terms of like goodwill and or alternate forms of currency depending upon how black market or not black market? And were there any trends that you particularly noticed? I'm just curious. Um, yeah, it's interesting. So uh, cryptocurrency isn't covered very heavily in the book, though. It's, it's really been in, inspiring to see it unfold. Um, and a great, a uh, good friend of mine wrote this book called uh, Hacking Finance, which is all about the sort of alternative currency and cryptocurrency movements. Um, and a lot of the principles that we talk about definitely animate those communities. One, um, one person who I did recently speak to was a bank robber who has since started up a cryptocurrency. And, and he was here in Berlin for a time. Um, and basically robbed over half a million dollars from Spanish banks. He took out all these mortgage, mortgages that he had no intention of ever paying back. And then he gave them to activist groups and fled to Brazil. And uh, then, he, um, then he came back. He stayed at my apartment and paid me in a new cryptocurrency that he's developing, um, which is called Faircoin, uh, which I think is really interesting. But, yeah, I don't know. I, th I think it's, you know, Bitcoin is maybe kind of what Napster did to the music industry. It's not necessarily the thing that is going to stick around. And I think there are also a lot of arguments against some of the sort of patriarchal culture to some of these cryptocurrencies and how they're designed that are valid. Uh, but it will be interesting to see ways in which, you know, citizens can better design the types of banking instruments that they need. And this is maybe the first wave of that. 
I'm just interesting because I'd say I'm not like necessarily a misfit, I'd say I'm an average misfit, <laughs> don't call it a misfit. Um, but what advice would you give to um, not necessarily the criminal or the um, same or adventurous misfit, that's just a standard person who's trying to, you know, get along in both parties just to um, stay true to themselves and, yeah, battle the corporate environment, like, from your experience? I mean, I think I have to do this too. I, I feel like at times, like there are moments where I can properly be a misfit and other times where I have to sort of camouflage myself a little bit more. Um, and I think a, a lot of people, you know, do that. And the experience of being an entrepreneur within a corporate environment is often about camouflage. And, and, and so I think the, the real thing that I have and that I've seen other people carry around with them is understanding what your mission is and what your non-negotiables are and then really noticing when those get violated. Um, but yeah, I think it, I, yeah, it, it really depends too on sort of what your bigger sort of remit is and what your bigger purpose is. But I think so many people experience a kind of mission drift where they start out with kind of misfit instincts. You know, as kids, we all, like when I, when I was little, Joan of Arc was amazing. And when I didn't start hearing voices when I was 17, I was like deeply disappointed that I hadn't been like part of something like this. Um, and then you, you sign up for these corporate cultures where, you know, it, those sorts of instincts you don't even really think about anymore. And so you gradually have this miss, mission drift through life where you lose sight of that. So I just think, you know, there's no one formula um, you know, the worst thing that could be used from this book is for someone to prescribe how someone should live because I think the nature of walking the misfit path is to sort of honor your own intuition and idiosyncrasy around how you feel and make decisions around, you know, authenticity versus camouflage. Um, that's something that's, you know, I've been, you know, I struggle with and I know a lot of people struggle with. You mentioned that like, a lot of people that you spoke to are really deeply uncomfortable with capitalism. Um, I've just read an article that says the end of capitalism uh, has begun. So um, where do you see the beginnings of like, the end of capitalism and like, what role will this play in that? When I started writing this book, I wanted it to be an alternative to capitalism. Like I hoped that we would interview people that were in the black markets or informal economies and that suddenly we would find all these amazing communitarian or um, alternative economies that we could learn from in the formal economy. But I think that wasn't the case. There wasn't sort of some magical blueprint for an alternative that we uncovered, but it was more, um, in the best possible way, like coping mechanisms for dealing with a transitional economy. Um, so where where will you know post capitalism? Where will we go? I don't I don't think we know yet. But I was speaking to someone about live action role playing earlier today, and he, I think this is a genre that I'm really interested in using to prototype different cultures of capitalism. Um, he was running a LARP, for example, around financial derivatives or around the future of banking. Um, and I think there are many ways in which we can use these game structures to actually embody potential future scenarios that we might actually want to live out. Um, but I'm pretty jaded in terms of, you know, even three years ago with the launch of, you know, the birth of the sharing economy and the new economics movement and all that that promised, I think we're seeing that it's really just sort of old school capitalism in sheep's clothing. So. Um, I don't know, I think it's, you know, capitalism has co-evolved with humans for the past kind of 500 years. And we can't just, you know, for, for good reason in a lot of ways. So as much as we might have scathing critiques of it, I think there are, there are things that capitalism does well. And, um, you know, speaking to people that have launched more alternative types of systems um, that are more sort of communitarian or maybe socialist in nature, uh, a lot of those cultures are uncomfortable to live in too. So I think we do really need to just to, to create more space for prototyping and embodying some of these things rather than signing up for a particular ideological agenda. Thanks so much for your talk, it's really so refreshing. Is there a survival kit that you actually recommend for people that actually are in these, the misfits, the wonderful misfits, oh, we're all misfits, but the great misfits that are in all these companies you mentioned where they're talking to brick walls, they're talking to blocks of wood. What's the survival kit? Leave, stay, if you stay, what do you do? What do you see what you with that? Yeah, so one of the things we created after the field guide for the League of Entrepreneurs was this, um, basically a toolkit 
in the art of how to be an entrepreneur. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's customized. So, you know, again, there's not one formula. People have to deal with these questions as they apply to them. But there were certain common questions that we kept getting asked. Um, particularly more junior entrepreneurs really need to know how to make the business case for what they're trying to do, how to connect what they, you know, their deepest values with the culture of the organization they're working for. And so there were lots of, um, we open sourced the entire toolkit and we spoke to a number of people that are working um, within this space, but also entrepreneurs themselves and w what advice would you give to others? Uh, so it is a bit of a, a corporate rebel kind of uh, toolkit in that sense. There's the art of resilience, I think, is also really critical. Um, how you manage your well-being within a company when you're going against the grain is just so difficult and can be so emotionally taxing. So, you know, even choosing what, what your battles are, you know, what does what is winning even look like kind of to, to this question of um, managing mission drift within organizations. Uh, so I think that's a that's a great place to start and then also creating you know for entrepreneurs There's so many resources where entrepreneurs can troubleshoot for each other But those resources don't necessarily exist for entrepreneurs And so we do see this more as a guerrilla movement that's happening within companies But then there's great value in bringing people together, you know for more of these therapeutic sessions where they can troubleshoot around the ventures they're creating or get advice from more seasoned entrepreneurs um, and also just feel honored and feel uh, known because I think it's much, it's such a lonely road compared to the entrepreneur. For an entrepreneur, success looks like having someone, you know, run with your idea and say that it's theirs within the company because you want to create, uh, you know, more devolved ownership over what you're doing. Whereas for any entrepreneur, I think they can be more motivated by, by traditional ego in a lot of ways. So it's a very different subset. Um, but yeah, it's one that I have a lot of respect for, and I think you know people like that are extremely patient. Alexis, thanks for the talk. Uh, I try to understand your pessimism about technology because um, if you look at it, so technology um, hierarchies are favored by paper-based technology, and only like the so digital technology makes it possible that we have like a more open work environments that we have like information in different places at the same time. So I, I don't understand the, the pessimism there. And also uh, if you look at um, trans, transactions costs and private, um, property rights theory from the 60s, uh, it may explain why the economy is evolving in this area that we see now. Okay, it doesn't matter what we own, we can share it because it's possible because of technology. So my question is, what is really your pessimism in technology? I don't get it. Yeah, I think my pessimism, I wouldn't say it's pessimism. I would say it's the spirit of provocation. I think um, I do have a certain frustration with the, the startup scene, which has become a very sort of monocultural idea of entrepreneurship. Um, I think technology has done amazing you know, things, but I think we haven't done a good job of necessarily understanding and critiquing elements of how technology is affecting um, the basic core of what it means to be human. How is technology affecting you know, our relationships, our sense of intimacy? Um, is it leading to you know, spikes in alienation? How is it affecting uh, how our brains are operating? I think these were all questions that I wanted to ask and didn't feel like were being asked within a sort of happy, clappy, techno-optimist type of culture. Uh, so I would never say, you know, we should, you know, go back to a sort of Luddite period. Um, I think technology has brought with it, you know, amazing advances, but I think we also need to focus on uh, more human-centric technology and also intentional tech. You know, like I'd love to see this movement for intentional technology grow where it wasn't as much dominated by VCs and um, the sort of IPO agenda and by short-term financial interest, but it was really dominated by um, people who you know, wanted to, sh to change the world pretty profoundly in, in good ways. I spoke to someone who was part of the, the first wave of creating you know, the internet, and um, he said so many of his friends who were in San Francisco during that time became really jaded with what the internet became. Um, how it became hijacked by corporate interests. And so I think with every technology, there was always this sort of optimism about it that never necessarily panned out. Um, and so it's just about providing a more nuanced conversation. And yeah, maybe in, 
in you know, 10 years, if there's this Luddite movement, I would be a provocateur that was this like techno-futurist because I felt like that was a conversation that needed to happen. So it's more just about creating space um, for, for more Socratic dialogue and for inquiry because I think societies need to question their sort of core assumptions. I was going to ask about the low-income communities themselves and whether there were people who felt a sense of co-optation um, that you were taking this, a, a couple of strategies that these communities had and, and using those teaching tools uh, for the mainstream economy. But I got distracted by the statistic that 33%, I think you said, of employees in corporations are sabotaging. How do you define sabotage? And yeah, so just on the second thing quickly, and then the co-option question I think is really interesting. Um, the sabotage statistic is by LRN that did a report on self-governing behaviors within the workplace. Um, so they did a massive survey, and there, there may be just something like 30 statistics that are all very shocking. And the point of the report was to understand that self-governing workplaces are actually more productive workplaces. Um, so you can, you can have a look there and see more. In terms of the co-option question, I think um, that was something that I was concerned by, but that I'm, you know, so much of the reporting around the black market and informal economy is extractive storytelling. You know, these, these sort of writers or journalists come and they, you know, they write these voyeuristic pieces and then they leave. And, you know, a lot of these guys never make any kind of money from that. And so I think with King Tone, for example, HBO did a whole documentary about him, um, but he can't even get a job right now. And so what we've been doing with the book is, um, you know, road showing, you know, him and, and you know, showing him to the business community as a leader because that's, you know, he, he thinks he can rival, you know, Richard Branson in terms of business strategy and, and lessons. Um, so I don't, you know, of the folks that we spoke to, I think everyone was down for what this movement would represent, um, which first just started, you know, as, as an empathy project. At our book launch in New York, there were, you know, awkward moments of like, ex-gangsters and um, members of the Latin Kings dancing with like the whitest of white people from the startup scene. And, as, and there was also mutual voyeurism on both sides there. But I think that's the beginning of beginning to, you know, of integrating these different, uh, these different cultures. And I think it's a way, um, for me, the strategy was more Trojan horse. It was, um, if we can dress up some of these disenfranchised populations in the dominant ideology of our age, which is entrepreneurship um, in many ways, and which is startup culture, and we can get people to see uh, just how incredible they are and, and provide uh, forays for some of these black market innovators to transition and have more you know, public forums for them to share their ideas, then I think that's a good thing. So I think it is also a temporary strategy where it's the first invitation really. Um, we're making, we're making you know, we made, uh, we brought King Tone to like a suburban book launch in Arlington, Virginia, and suddenly all these like country club people were really interesting and in, interested in talking about, uh, you know, gangs and violence and poverty in America, and that never would have happened. And he, he, you know, massively enjoyed it too. So I think it's definitely a, a valuable um, and difficult question, but one that we've tried to navigate uh, by not just doing extractive storytelling and by finding ways of of bringing a lot of these guys into what we're trying to create. Hello, and thank you as well. I have a quick question, can, can, well, when you call it a misfit ownership, what does that look like? I, I'm wondering if the friend you mentioned was maybe Jaron Lanier, I read his brother's book uh, earlier this year, um, and he spoke about how, how, how technology is impacting ownership and how it creates a like winner-takes-it-all scenario capitalism where there's actually just uh, like much fewer winners than in earlier times and much more losers and um, where you just need to own an algorithm and then you have like and people might share their apartments or stuff but they still depend on you for the algorithm and that's where you, your money comes from and then my question was connected to like how does misfit ownership could look like or how could it look like and how could a form of ownership look like that enables more people to um, work as the misfits that they probably want to be. Yeah, I think it's great. And I think um, 
you know, if sharing economy companies became cooperatives, that would sort of be more along this line. Like his his whole um, argument basically is that people, if if Facebook is mining your data, that you should have a financial stake in that. That this should be something that's more cooperatively owned. Um, and I know people have called on like Uber to to develop similar models. Uh, there's a woman I spoke to who's running a really interesting hackathon around. Um, this theme of the workers lab and so bringing old school sort of labor activists and unionists together with people that are part of the emerging sharing economy to decide what are some of the ways that we can sort of freshen this traditional sort of labor perspective for this modern sort of freelancer economy and what would that look like. Um, so again, I think, you know, ex experimenting with cooperative ownership structures would be, would definitely be one way to go. But I think the challenge there too is democracy. Those sorts of democracies are built on transaction costs. Democracy isn't frictionless. And sharing economy, like their main, these bigger, these companies are all about frictionless transactions. Like that's how they're making their money. So to some extent, these cultures are incompatible. Um, and it will be interesting, I think, to see how they can coexist side by side, or if um, you know if they can even develop or harness some of these practices. Well, Alexa, it's a, it's a marvelous book, uh, which I hope everyone has a chance to read if you haven't already. Uh, and it's part of a project that's now been ongoing for for a couple of years. Uh, what's next for the chief misfit, but also for the misfit economy more generally? We've done some really fun guerrilla marketing around the book. Um, we sent out Nigerian spam, fake Nigerian spam, to tons of our friends and had them mail it on to other people, which was enjoyable. We postered um, and sort of tagged graffiti around New York City when we launched. Uh, we did these hacked book covers. Um, so that's been, yeah, that's been really fun. And then we're, some of the people in the book, um, you know, who are in the black markets, we're trying to build, uh, you know, platforms for them to connect with our audience. So we want to launch a skill share course in the fall where we get, you know, King Tone and um, the camel milk trader that I didn't talk much about. And some of these other um, protagonists actually teach some of these skills so that they can be making money off of it, but they can also, you know, it can provide, you know, them with direct engagement with, with the public in a different way. So I think it's having all these different uh, manifestations that you know we won't really be able to control but that will sort of blossom from there. What's wonderful I, I, I want to uh, to thank you for for coming and joining us tonight and sharing uh, your ideas with uh, with the public here it, it really strikes me uh, and those who are who already know the Berlin School as well I hope also see the you know the, the very close resonance uh, Berlin School we, we look for creativity and creative leadership not just in developing products or even generating business solutions, but uh, in improving organizations and society more generally. And in you, um, we've really found a kindred spirit. So thank you for sharing. Great, thank you. Ah, oh, amazing. Thank you. This is great.